thank you all for joining us. Um, we, we are here with Gorilla, as you know. Uh, I'll have you handing over to Joe Evershed. Now, thank you for everyone who's um, participated in the Mentimita. If you'd like to get back to that later, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, but for now, I'll hand over to Joe. So let me just stop sharing my screen. Um, I think that's good. Can everybody see my screen, Nick? Is, can you see my screen? Yeah, that's good. Fantastic. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much to Sage for inviting me to come and talk about gamified research. I'm Joe Evershed. I'm the founder of um, Guerrilla Experiment Builder and the host for the Behavioral Science Online Conference. I've been helping researchers take their studies online since about 2020. 20, 12, so over 10 years now, and often we've used gamification techniques to increase participant engagement and motivation and consequently increase data qualities in scenarios that would have otherwise been impossible to collect data. So first of all, what is a game? A game is a system in which players engage in a fictional challenge defined by rules, interactivity and feedback, which results in a quantifiable outcome often promoting an emotional reaction. In experimental tasks, we already do a lot of these things anyway. Our tasks tend to be defined by rules, they're interactive, we give participants feedback, and we're after a quantifiable outcome. Did they get it wrong? Right, did they get it wrong? Did they do it at the right speed, at too slow a speed? So it isn't a massive leap to turn a research task into a game. To take psychology tasks the rest of the way only involves adding a narrative, and creating a positive emotional experience rather than having tasks feel like a chore. They might not be brilliant games that will be on the next PlayStation and making millions of dollars, but they are games. If you want to read more about the taxonomy of games, I've put a link in the chat. And Nick, if you can, if you can share that now, that would be great. So let's look at some case studies from projects that we've worked on over the last 10 years. The COG project was a traditional intervention design investigating the development of adolescent cognition and importantly if there were sensitive periods in adolescence for certain types of cognition. So your classic intervention design has a test battery at time one, then there's the intervention, which was this 12 weeks of training, and then a test battery at time two, which is at the end of the 12 weeks, and then a follow-up test battery, six-month follow-up. The big challenge here was motivating teenagers to come back every day. How do you get teenagers to come and take part in boring tasks every day for 30 days in order to see if that training would show a sensitive period in their cognition? So the game for te techniques that we use in this uh, project involved particle effects, so puffs of smokes and stars and rewarding feedback, and also a daily trophy cabinet that they were incentivized to complete. In this case, in the case of this particular project, it was important to keep the tasks as close to traditional research as possible. So this project involved minimal gamification within the task, but an exciting trophy cabinet outside the actual task. Importantly, we couldn't use points. The adaptive algorithm to push the teenagers to the limits of their cognition would take participants to the points where they were only succeeding 50% of the time. So points for getting the answer right might have been demotivating. The STAR project was another classic intervention design investigating whether deaf students trained in speech reading develop greater dysemic discrimination. So visemes are the visual equivalent to phonemes. And of course, um, deaf students who are good at lip reading have really good visemic discrimination. A unique challenge of this project was reaching young deaf students in schools in such a way that limited disruption to the class and was not onerous for teachers. Teachers are already busy enough in schools, they don't need to take on responsibility for your research project too. So our solution was to create a fun to play speech reading game that was accessible with school equipment. All the, had to, the teacher had to do was log in the students and then the game would do the rest. Let's have a look at your speech reading skills. So here we've got a little alien and I'm going to click this button here, uh, here in fact, and then you're going to see somebody say a word and I want you to type in the chat what you think they're saying. So here the, the student would have pressed the ring and he says something. What do you think he said? Type it in the chat, chat see if you've got it right. So here the phrase, ah, oh, that was wrong. It wasn't banana. He, he threw up and four to six year olds think that is the most hilarious thing in the world, a little alien throwing up. And then he actually says helicopter. Some of you might have got that from the fact that it had four syllables. And then the alien farts in a spectacular array of colours, which is also massively funny if you're a 46 year old, four or six year old, not a 46 year old. Um, so the gamification uh, techniques in this project involved in 
giving the instructions in a in a way for the students who can't hear or read. We couldn't speak the instructions, they can't hear. We couldn't write them, they couldn't read. So we were animating the buttons and, sh and showing with the hand that grabbed that the alien would look and then open his mouth. So it was all the animations that taught the kids how to play the game. Then making it engaging so that students wanted to play every day and motivating. There was a sort of overall narrative through this game. And then there was a trophy cabinet also for overall motivation to complete the protocol. Here's another game. It's a slightly different one. This was for adults. This was done online. Um, I'm showing this one because it's one of the rare cases where we have the before and after videos. The left one is the lab version that couldn't go online, but the right one is the gamified version, which they could collect their data via prolific for this task. So you could suddenly, by taking the game online, you can get access to that large participant pool super fast. Um, so that you don't have to spend all that time doing your data collection. But under the bonnet, these games are exactly the same. So this task is a two alternate voice choice task that are commonplace in neuroeconomics and decision making. Here we have an unarmed bandit where you choose between the slot machines or the cards and try and find the one that pays out the most. And it's your score that helps you understand whether you're doing well or doing badly. The gamification techniques in this project involve the narrative. So in the game version, it's like, you're in a casino, try to win. It's a really easy narrative. You have your score, which gives you feedback and then easy to understand and pleasing feedback that when you click on the card, you either get a bunch of stars that tell you you made the right choice or you get, um, I think, some smoke, which tells you you got it wrong. Before we move on, let's first reflect on the primary purpose of gamification. As research scientists, our primary interest is in collecting high quality data or creating a high quality intervention. Those are the sort of two things. And that data or intervention is improved by increasing participant motivated, motivation and engagement. If your participant is motivated and engaged, they will pay attention to your task and they will do better at it. And this allows you to get better quality data. So gamification is particularly important in research situations where motivating, motivation and engagement would otherwise be low. The data quality framework identifies three drivers of data quality that are under your control during the participant experience. The relationship you form with a participant, the experience you create for them, and the quality controls that you put in place to identify low quality data. So gamification primarily impacts the experience that you're creating for participants. But it does also change the relationship we form with them and encourages some better and easier data quality controls. If you're interested more on data quality and participant engagement, then Nick's going to share a link to a webinar that I've given previously on this topic. So when should you consider making a game? We've seen from the case studies that I've shown different aspects of gamification, theming, narrative, scoring, animations, particle effects, trophy cabinets. But how do you decide which technique to use? And more importantly, what problem does each technique solve? In this next section, I'd like you to think about whether you've had any of these research challenges that I'm about to talk about and think about what impact gamification would have had on your data or whether gamification would have enabled research that you assumed was impossible. Gamification helps with dull, repetitive tasks, which makes up quite a lot of psychological research. Unfortunately, not every task protocol can be rich and rewarding in itself. Some just aren't that fun. And as a result, we run into problems with participant engagement. Participants get tired, they get bored, attrition goes up and so on. For these kinds of tasks, creating a fiction around what the player is doing and why can go a long way to alleviating these problems. In this study, we created eight different go, no go tasks. Say in the chat if you're familiar with go, no go tasks, they're really, really boring. You just have to decide whether to click the space bar or not click the space bar, depending on what you see on the screen. And kids had to complete 10 minutes a day of a go, no go task for over eight weeks to see if we could change, um, train inhibitory control. Overall, the kids completed over 4,000 trials of, a of this boring go, no go task, and they still reported enjoying the game. So we did a really good job on the gamification. Let's have a look at them. Also, there's a link here to, um, to a whole lecture by Nico Steinbeis, whose game this is. So do have a 
do have a look at that if you want to know more. So these, so when you first, the participant first logged in, they choose, they got to choose who their hero was. So a little bit of agency always helps us feel engaged. And then they were shown the instructions. You, you've crash landed your plane. You need to go on a quest to get some spare parts. So there's the crash landed plane. There's the monk. And here they got to their first place and they have to choose which cave to go, it, cave to go into. There was some instructions. And here, all you have to do is whack the boulder um, and you get uh, gems and you get um, coins depending. Uh, so, so you have to whack it when it's a coin and not whack it when it's a gem, I think. Next, this is a different environment. So also we had a variety of skins. So they, I think in the first week they were in the jungle. In the second week, I think they might have been going through the ice. Um, here there's a different go no go game um, where you have to press the button to get the gold, but not press it. You have to inhibit when you uh, see the dragon and then you get a gem. And this was another game. There were more too, but this one is different because you've got a stream of stimuli that are irrelevant. And then occasionally you get a relevant stimuli. You have to move one way or another, depending on that. So go that way, don't go that way. Um, and depending on that, you get coins um, or gems. So this is different skins and more visually appealing particle effects that make playing a go no go task every day for 10 minutes fun. Other times our task is perfectly interesting enough, but our, our protocol is just long. For whatever reason, we need our part participants to get through a lot of trials and we can end up with some of the same challenges, boring, uh, boredom, fatigue, attrition, and so on. This is where points and rewards can be really effective. Rather than just doing the trials over and over to get to the end, you now feel like you're succeeding. You're getting points, you're going on an adventure, you're completing something and you're making progress towards the end. Um, so this puzzle game is actually for studying developmental language disorder. Kids with developmental language disorder really struggle with understanding relational statements like put the wheel on top of the bat or put the wheel below the bat. And so here when they, I'm not playing the sound here, but when you play that little sound cue at the bottom, which would pulse after a while, it will play a sound cue and then the child needs to follow the instructions. Importantly here, you're seeing an example of you don't give feedback when they get it wrong. The chicken just doesn't go in when they get it wrong, when they get it. So they're when they get it right eventually they succeed so there's no sense of failure there's just sometimes it takes you longer to succeed than others but by with the repeated practice you get better and better if you want to know more about this research there's a link here at the bottom of the slide um this is Dorothy G. bishop's research over from the university of oxford Another place where games can be really useful is that instructions are sometimes difficult to understand when they're abstract. Human cognition deals better with narratives, so a game narrative that allows us, allows us to bypass this confusion while making the task fun. Here we have a range of motor function tasks which are easy to understand as part of a game. game. This research was done for Nikhil Sharma at UCL um, investigating motor function. Let's have a look at these games. So this one, you just have to tap, uh, pop the balloons as many times as you can in 10 seconds, because uh, that's a really great measure, measure of rapid motor activity. This one, you have to tap on the wasp um, at the beginning and at the end. And this allows us to see how quickly you can move your arm in the direction that we want you to move it and how you, if you can link together more complicated motor sequences. This game, you have to tap with your fingers as if you're playing the piano, I guess, on the um, fireworks in the right order. And in doing this, this game, the, um, the patients are learning an implicit motor sequence and we're seeing whether you continue to learn motor sequences over time. And this game is one where we're tracking motor function to see if you can keep your finger on the train and we could change the track to make it more complicated. When your finger is on the train, the train moves at its fastest. When your finger can't track the train and it drifts away, the train goes slower. So it's a really good measure of your ability to predict and track with your, with your motor movements. So these are examples of how you could have done those games with just a black line saying, trace your finger along the line. But making it a, a game makes it more fun and enjoyable and, and, and some of the tasks makes it easier to understand. Other times, 
Gamification allows us to both train and collect data from children that would otherwise be impossible. The speech reading game that we looked at earlier was for kids who are aged four to six years old. They had to do eight hours of practice on vasemic discrimination. And the games made that a reasonable asks of the children, their parents and their teachers. They didn't do it all in one go. I think they did about 10 minutes a day over 12 weeks. Um, but it's still no parent would have signed a child up to do that much practice if it wasn't fun. But if it's fun and the kids are enjoying themselves, it's like, great, yes, let's continue doing that. And there's a link down here as well if you want to hear more about Mairead McSweeney's research at UCL. With longitudinal research, we can also add gamified trophy cabinets that aren't strictly within a task, but to encourage participants to come back and take part in the next session. Um, this study is for Jesse Ricketts over at Royal Holloway. And what we did here was um, the participants had to read a book uh, and map, like, co basically collect points from reading books and reading pages in a book. Um, and they were motivated to do that by once they had read enough um, pages, they would get a clue and that clue would help them solve this murder and mystery. So this is just a gamified version of a trophy cabinet. You can unlock a clue, clue. Here we've got the forensic team found a brown hair that belongs to the suspect. And then over time, you'd release more and more clues. And this, uh, these clues come together to help you identify who had committed the robbery. Finally, games can also be a great way of crowdsourcing data. So if you don't want to use a, a recruitment service, instead you can crowdsource data. With a little bit of PR or advertising, you can then collect a lot of data for free and really quickly. See HeroQuest, which is this game up here by um, Hugo Spears at UCL studying um, navigation and Alzheimer's disease. They've recorded data from 4.3 million players who have played for a total of 117 hours. That is an extraordinary amount of research data. Collecting 117 years worth of data via a recruitment service would have cost around 10 million pounds. So it's also a really good investment in research data. It's not just medical research. Um, on navigation, Lucy Cheek is also doing medical research and she's using games to collect uh, data on long on kids with long COVID symptoms or kids who haven't had uh, long COVID as well can haven't had COVID or long COVID can also play. She needs a control condition. So if you've got kids, this is a plea from Lucy. If you've got kids, uh, Nick's going to share the link and you're interested in helping researchers un understand um, the effects of COVID co cognitive symptoms in kids. Do consider having your kid play these games. And then Sandra van der Linden, also at Cambridge, has been using games to inoculate people against fake news and COVID misinformation. These are games that you can go and play uh, about COVID misinformation, misinformation and fake news. So while often we can think that games are um, frivolous, um, they can be serious, both in, ter in terms of the research value that they provide, but also in terms of the good that they do within the world. So before I went through these, I'd said to you, think, I'd like to like you to think about whether you've had any of these research challenges, what impact gamification could have had on your data or whether gamification would have enabled research that you had assumed was impossible. So now it's time to share. I'm just going to open up the chat. Think about your current or past research projects. What research, did you have any of these research um, Challenges. Have you had to de deal with working with kids, longitudinal data? Have you had to deal with um, really long trials? Have you had to deal with um, really boring trials? Type it in the chat now. Have you had to deal with any of these types of challenges in your research? Anyone? Anyone done longitudinal research? Yes, Catherine's done something. Change it. Make sure that you type your answers to everyone rather than just to me. Um, what type of challenges have you had? Have, have participants enjoyed your studies? Have they been bored by them? Have you had the experience of participants 
looking at your participant data and thinking they weren't doing the, ta the task properly and they got bored? Have you worried that participants have been daydreaming while they're taking part in research? Ah, yes, you're gathering data from children, long, boring tasks, that's been particularly hard. We've had opportunity tests that people found boring and long. We'd like to gamify them. Longitudinal research with adolescents, four times over two years, really hard. Teenagers get bored very quickly. Yes, they do. And they're ruthlessly interested in themselves. So unless it's good for them, they're just not going to do it. Adults, you can pay them to give you data that's of research value for the common good. You can sort of you can use that social social norm to make them take part. It doesn't work with with kids. They they're in it for themselves. College students and adults get bored. Um, yeah, so oftentimes people just get bored. So, and now think about your current research projects. What could, if you think about your current research projects, is there anything you could do to make it better? Would these techniques work? So the next question I'd like to ask is what stopped you using gamification? Was it that you didn't know that you could do this? Was it that it was too expensive, too slow? You didn't have access to developers. You didn't know how to do it. You were scared by gamification for some reason, if you if you thought about it, or you just thought it was too hard or too much work. Do any of those resonate with you? Yeah, that's, I didn't know how. I didn't know how to use get, get, gamification. Didn't know how to do it. Concerned about the cost. Lack of experience building games. Don't know how to do it. Developers are expensive far too expensive, I didn't know who could program it, didn't have a platform. All of these are very common problems that we have heard. Yeah, worried about the technical expertise, no skill. Um, exactly, these are all the worries that researchers have when they think about using games. So, if games allow you to increase participant motivation and engagement and so collect higher quality data, then gamification would be valuable to lots of researchers. So over the years, we started to ask the question, how can gamified research be brought to researchers at scale? How can we make it so that games are accessible to lots of people so that you can all go and create your own games? What would that look like? And the solution we found was to build a game building tool that's easy enough for researchers to use themselves without needing a developer. An easy to use tool addresses many of the barriers that prevented researchers using gamification. As people have said, games are far too expensive for many. Some of the games I've presented earlier, their budgets were between £40,000 and £250,000. That's a lot of research money. To make gamification possible, it would need to be at a much lower price point. And we've heard under £10,000 would be amazing. A tool makes gamification affordable to many. Games are too slow and fiddly for many research tasks, and iterating back and forth with the developer is a frustrating experience on both sides. And, and that iteration process in a research game is so important. Because you pilot your task, you want to make a little tweak. You pilot it again, oh, I need to fix that. You look at it again, you check the data quality, ah, oh, something's not quite working here. You need that time to do that rapid experimentation to get your task working properly. And that's really painful to do with a developer. So we needed to create a fast and easy to use tool that makes it easy for scientists to tweak their protocols as they pilot their tasks. A tool makes gamification, and so the tool makes gamification accessible to many. With our tools, we aim for the same level of complexity as PowerPoint or Excel so that we reduce the technical barrier. Games and code are also very hard to reuse and repurpose for new research projects. Either the code hasn't been maintained or the developer has moved on or it's just too fiddly. So with our tools, we separate the game visuals from the trial contents so that it's easier and faster to reuse when you have a new research project. And then, and that again, that gives your research games that you've invested in creating more longevity and more, more opportunities for reuse. Also through all of our experience, we've worked out what a game building tool needs to be able to do. You need to be able to do the theming, the narratives, the artwork, you're gonna need scoring, animations, you're gonna need particle effects and trophy cabinets. 
but also, and perhaps more importantly, it needs to be easy to use, and easy to adapt, and easy to share with other researchers. So that's the end of my bit of the talk, but in the chat, would you like to now see how easy it is to design and build a research game? Would you like to see Nick build a research game in under 30 minutes? Would that be fun? Good, so many of you. Yes, that's exactly what you want. It's like, you can imagine I could go away, you could go away tomorrow and build a research game in 30 minutes, put it online and no participant is going to complain to you and say that was a boring task. They're gonna come back and say, that was the most fun research project I've ever taken part in. Do you have another research project I can take part in? That's the experience we want to create for participants because it's going to be so much more fun. Thank you so much for being an amazing audience and for being so responsive. I really appreciate it. It makes my life much easier and now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Nick is going to take over. Thank you Joe. yes give me a second to get this going. Um, okay so if I share all right can you see my slides? Yes I can see them Nick. All right, fantastic. So, uh, so hello everybody. Thank you, Joe. Um, so yes, we've seen how games can be useful in our research. We've now obviously Joe's given you a really uh, lovely run through uh, why you'd want to use them. Uh, she's told you when you'd want to use them, but I'm sure there's still plenty of thinking, but how do I actually do it? How do I design one and how do I build one? And that's what I'm gonna talk you through now. Um, so uh, first things first, um, so, the first step is to design your game. How do you actually go about designing a game? How do you go from a blank piece of paper to an idea that you can actually go ahead and build? Now, I'm sure some of you might be thinking, oh, designing a game sounds really hard, I don't know how to start, I'm not a gamer, I don't have a PlayStation. Don't worry. We're making small, simple games for research, not doing the next Call of Duty, but what we can do is take a lot of the ideas from mainstream games and distill them down into something very simple and accessible. Now, I spent several years in the game industry before I created Gorilla. I've done this loads of times, and by the end of this talk, I'm going to make game designers out of all of you. So, to get started, the first thing is to design your fiction. This is um, the, the, the sort of environment that your game takes place in. So, you want to start by creating a world that your player is in. You want to give your player some kind of agency in that world. I need to give your player something to do. Ideally, you want to align the mechanics with the goals that you're setting. Now, this might sound very high and lofty, so you can boil it down to just four sentences. Um, here you go. Uh, just fill in the blanks. You are in space. <laughs> you are an astronaut. You have to repair the space station. Watch out for asteroids. Good luck. There you go. Simple as that. That's all you need to get started. Once you've then got your, um, <clears throat> your, your setting, the, the second step is to storyboard this out. Now this basically means you just, I just draw it out, paper, PowerPoint, whatever works for you. Uh, just sketch out what happens step by step, screen by screen. You probably had some ideas when you were thinking about your fiction in the first step. So just draw those out and kind of add, add around them. Now this design phase is super important. This is where you work out how the interactions are going to work uh, and also crucially where you get rid of 90% of the ideas that are, are lovely in theory but are just going to be too hard or too fiddly. Um, after that you need some artwork. Now we're not going to create any art ourselves. That's a whole massive uh, discipline in and of itself. We're going to find artwork that already exists and just use that. So the way to decide what you need is you make a list of all the individual props that you drew in your storyboard. Think about when you did plays at school and all the hand props you kind of needed. That's all we're looking for here. And then just go searching for images for them. Uh, image search is a good place to start. The big stock image sites like Shutterstock have got loads of great options. Don't get into drawing anything yourself. Just use stuff that's already there. Um, it's often worth a small amount of money it takes to buy some stuff from these uh, from these. Uh, stock image sites. If that's not an option for you, there are some attribution free ones that you can use. That Pixabay one that's on my side, I found really useful. Um, so there's some good options in there. If you find you need too many, and I'm finding a lot of the games I'm making at the moment, I, I need around 10 or fewer images to put them together. If, if it's too many, just go back to your storyboards and simplify. Um, you can do an awful lot with just one image. Um, so in that example at the top, you can make a whole forest with just one tree scale it up and down a bit, make some darker or lighter, flip some of them horizontally, and suddenly from one tree image you built a whole forest. Transparent backgrounds are usually a must because it lets you layer them up nicely, so try and avoid ones that have got a, like a solid background. 
And the only actual image manipulation you're going to have to do is maybe resizing some things or cropping them uh, once you download them. You've probably got some kind of uh, image manipulation software on your computer. Um, if you don't, there's this, that one there called PhotoP, which is really, uh, it's essentially Photoshop in the browser that's, uh, that's free to use. That might also uh, help you do what you want. Um, and then it's time to build it. So as I always say, like stub out the big parts and then come back and fill in the details later. Um, I think this is general, but if, um, it, particularly with games, if something's just not working or it's too hard to get it to look right, uh, just take a step back and see if there's an easier way. Go back to your storyboards, you can change how a sequence works or consider a different piece of art if you can't get it to look right. It's often quite an organic process. And then finally, you need to pilot it. Uh, obviously, you'd always pilot your studies, but for games, I think the main things you want to ask yourself are, do people understand what to do? What do you need to put into your instructions and what is just sort of self-evident uh, from the setting? Um, is any of the art confusing or distracting? Are maybe some of your uh, things ambiguous or is there too much movement in the background? Um, and finally, is it fun? Now, obviously we're doing all this for a search, but still, is it satisfying and engaging to play? Are people gonna want to get to the end of it? So before we get started with tooling, um, I'd like you all to have a go. So um, uh, remembering these uh, four statements, think of a task you're working on right now, or maybe a task you've run in the past, and have a go at coming up with a setting for a gamified version of it yourself. Uh, I'll give you a few minutes to have a try, and then we'll hear a few of them. Um, and let's see what we've got in the chat. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so have a have a go. You are in. So pick any kind of environment. You are a some kind of uh, some kind of entity in that environment that has some kind of abilities or some kind of agency. You have to some kind of mission, some kind of quest that you need to complete, and watch out for some kind of hazard or uh, or, or or antagonist. Um, See if you can see if you can come up with your own ones uh, for those and put them in the chat. And I'll see what you come up with. Um, yes, superhero, they need to watch out for aliens. Brilliant. That's lovely. I think I've just working with a client who was doing a superhero one the other day. Um, and that's starting to come out really nicely. Um, the hospital one where you got uh, a healthcare worker trying to avoid the germs. Um, and sailing, it was a scare off the sirens from your, from your ship. That's lovely. Um, yeah, so you can all do this. It's, these, these are perfect. You've absolutely nailed it. That's exactly how you go for it. <coughs> oh, wheelchair in the, in the traffic. Nice. Um, so you've absolutely got that. So, there, so once you've got that bit worked out, and, you've, you've, and I think you'll find as you're... Um, and you're imagining these things, you're sort of imagining a bit, a bit about what it might look like on the screen. And that's, that's how you get into your, your storyboarding. All right, fantastic. Um, so having done that, let's actually go ahead and make it. Let's make a game. So um, for our work example, we're going to make a simple go, no go task. It's similar to the one that Joe was describing earlier. Um, and essentially in this task, uh, the participants is presented with some kind of stimulus on the screen. And there are three possible responses they can give. They can either give response A, whatever that means, for response B, or they can do nothing. Um, and now this is quite a basic paradigm, and I've chosen this because you'll see you, uh, you can either simplify it into an even simpler go, no go, where you either just press a button or don't press a button, or you could extend it into a delayed stop signal task, or you could add in some other kind of variations on it to make it harder uh, or more complicated. So that you'll see towards the end, there's a lot of different ways that we can uh, rework this. So here we go. Here's my fiction. You are in the forest. You are a rabbit. You have to collect the apples but watch out for empty trees. Good luck. Um, so the, the, the basic concept here is that we're going to, in the scene, there are gonna be two trees and on one of these trees, an apple will appear and you have to press left if there's an apple on the left tree, right if there's an apple on the right tree and nothing if there's no apples. And, um, and this is obviously gonna be, uh, if we just did a very, very uh, sort of, uh, straightforward version of this without any kind of theme, this will quickly get quite boring. Um, but uh, but we're going to want to make this a bit more interesting. So I've gone ahead and sourced some art. So this is the kind of level, this is the level and the quantity of art that we sort of uh, need for this kind of thing. We need a tree, we need an apple, uh, we need a rabbit. And then I've act what I've actually done is chopped out a bit of the middle of that tree so we can make a sort of shaking effect when the apple appears. So it just looks like more of the leaves. Some grass for the foreground and then a cloud for the sky. And I've made a little kind of speech bubble with the apple with a cross over it, which we're going to use as feedback if we're when the participants, uh, if they go for the, the tree that doesn't have an apple in it. 
So um, let's get stuck in. So this is the Gorilla Game Builder. Um, now, I like to start by just stubbing out the basic bits of animation that make up the trial. So go ahead and create a scene. Um, and the first thing we will do is just make the tree and then make the apple kind of appear on it. So the first thing we do is create a sprite. A sprite is just a game word for an image, basically. Uh, we'll drag our tree in there. Um, <clears throat> and then there's our tree. We're going to build most of this out on the left-hand side, and then we can easily just duplicate it for the right-hand side later, which I often find is also quite useful as well. Now we want our apple. So we're going to have an animated sprite here, which is just another sprite, exactly the same as a tree. So we can go ahead and set it up the same way. Um, and then we're going to animate it. Now, the animation tools in the game builder are very similar to what you do in PowerPoint. So resize the apple, put it roughly where we want it. And now we're going to open our animation tool. We'll add a, an animation clip, which is basically one little sequence of animation, which we'll call appears, is what's going to happen when the apple appears. And we want it to fade in. So we'll add a fade in. Uh, about 200 milliseconds. That's all quite nice. Uh, and then we'll just to move up a little bit. So it's going to fade in and sort of rise up a bit so that we, we so that it's very, very salient and, the, and that we see it happen. Um, we want it to start invisible. So there's another component we can put in just to do that. Um, and then whenever we play our clip, it will appear. We'll set it to appear at the start just for now so we can see it working. So now when I hit play, we can see, there we go. Uh, our tree is there. And when we hit play, the apple fades in and raises up. So it's as simple as that, to put in a couple of images and animate them so we start to see some movement on the screen. Um, let's press on and make the rabbit. So same trick again. We want another animator sprite. Um, we will go ahead and add our uh, rabbit texture in. Uh, oops, there we go. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, there's our rabbit. We want the rabbit to be in the middle of the screen, but at the beginning, we sort of want them to kind of come in from off screen. So what we do here is um, rather than putting the rabbit off screen where we can't see it, we're going to position it in its sort of natural place in the middle of the screen and add that start off screen component to say it's going to start at the bottom. We then make another clip. I'm going to call this one up here as well. Um, and what we want to do is just want to, because we're starting it off screen, we want it just to move to its sort of default position, which is that place in the middle of the screen. The other thing we could do is we can actually have two animations playing at the same time. This is quite a nice trick where we want it to move, but we're also going to make it start slightly bigger. We're going to scale it up. And then as it moves, we're going to scale it back down to its normal size. And as it starts out bigger and gets smaller, um, that's going to give us this sort of like false perspective effect, this sort of foreshortening that makes it look like it's kind of going into the screen at the same time, uh, which is quite a nice trick. So let's set our rabbit to appear at the start of the screen and hit play and see that happening. So now when we when we uh, start the scene, we see our apple come in and then we see our, our rabbit come in. And that, uh, we see that foreshortening effect, which makes the rabbit look like it's going sort of into the screen a bit. Um, OK, good. So the next what we want to do is add our responses in. So this is going to be, uh, we're going to use the keyboard for this. We're going to press the left and right key. So we add a keyboard response component in. And what we're going to do is map uh, the keys that we want uh, to listen for. So we want the left key to give us the response left. And then we want the right key to give us the response right. What's nice about mapping them this way is we changed our mind later and you decide to use F and J or, or Q and P or something like that. We can just change the mapping and everything else stays intact. So. We've got our response mapping. And what we want to happen when we press left, we want the rabbit to run over to the tree, uh, have the apple fall down, and then the rabbit run back. So what we're going to start by doing is adding this container here. Now, you can use containers to either group objects together, but also just as a locator, essentially. So we're going to add this at the bottom of the tree, roughly where we want the rabbit to run to, um, because then it's much easier to, uh, to describe our, our movement animation. So. We're going to make another animation here, which we're going to call collect left, because it's going to collect an apple from the left tree. Um, and so we do the same thing again. We want him to move to a particular object this time. We want him to move to rabbit left. Um, we'll give him, say, half a second to do that. Then we're going to add a little delay, because we want then, in that delay is when we're going to make the apple fall off the tree. And then we want the, and then we want the rabbit to move back again. Um, so another half second there. Um, so again, you can see how we can layer these things up um, really nice and simply. So we've got our animation, we've got our keyboard responses, but we need to stitch the two together. So we've got another one we're going to use here called a trigger. Um, so we want to trigger our animation based on certain responses. So we go down here to our triggers and we say, OK, when we get a response and the response is left, and it's correct, we don't want to do this if there obviously isn't that on the tree, then we want to play our collect left animation. Simple as that. Um, so that's why the, the, the three of those up. 
Um, what we're going to do now, let's get the, let's make the apple falling bit work. So we can go in here, we can add a fall animation for our apple. Uh, oops, Susie. And um, again, this is going to be the similar to the rabbit. We're going to have it fall to the same, to that same point. Um, again, this is a nice thing about using these, um, using these sort of locators to mark particular places on the screen is that we can reuse them and make sure the two, both the rabbit and the apple will end up in the same place. So we want that to move down there. We actually need to put a delay in first. We need to have a delay of half a second for the rabbit to move there. Um, so we can just reorder those. Um, then we want it to fall down to the, um, the lo that location. And then finally, we want to add, uh, we'll just hide it when it gets there. So it looks like the rabbit's collected. So when the rabbit runs away, the apple's disappeared. Um, there we go. Uh, so we've set those two things up. We can now add our, we need to trigger this one in the same way. So we can add that. Um, so this is the same kind of thing. Whenever we get a response of left that is correct, we want to add our fall animation. There we go. Right. Let's uh, see all this in action. So we hit play. Um, our rabbit comes in. I've added a little shake to the leaves in the meantime. Um, so he moves to the side, the apple falls down, and they moves back again. That's looking pretty good, but it could look better. Let's um, let's put our let's put our scaling trick in again. So we'll add another channel. We'll do the scaling thing. Um, so it looks again like the, the rabbit's going into the screen when he goes towards the tree and then comes back out again, which again adds this sort of nice uh, this this sort of sense of depth uh, that's going on here. So what again you're seeing here is that we're is that we're managed to do lots of very very simple animations here. We're not uh, keyframing individual limbs or anything crazy like that. Uh, we can do a lot of it with literally just moving and scaling things around the screen, and you can actually make it look quite compelling. Um, so that's wide all that up. So there we are. Um, there's the apple. We go over there. He collects the apple. It comes back. Now to complete the whole sequence, what we actually want is the we want the app, we want the rabbit to move off screen again at the end. So we'll add one more um, animation clip for our rabbit uh, called Leave, and we can do uh, a similar thing to how we had them come on. We can have just a move off screen animation and say move off screen to the bottom, um, and um, we'll, and then we'll, we'll do the scaling thing again. Now what we can do here, which is quite nice, which we'll see in a second, is that um, when we finish the collecting animation, we're then going to trigger the leaving animation. So not only can you uh, combine these different animations together to make these nice sequences, you can then actually um, uh, trigger whole clips from one another to build these quite, what look like quite complicated uh, sort of chains of, of animation. So once we've done our collection, the last thing we want to do is trigger the uh, leaving animation on ourselves. And now we can see the whole thing in action. So we start our trial, our rabbit comes on, the apple appears, we press the left key, he goes over, collects the apple and goes off screen again. So that's our, our whole sort of um, trial loop kind of working. Um, okay, the next thing is to add a background. I'm going to skip the building bit of it because it's just more of what you've seen. But essentially there's two gradients. So it's just, just a block of color where we can set two different uh, colors, one stop, one for the bottom, and then it, it uh, interpolates between them. And a bunch of sprites. I had a couple in the sky to be the clouds and, um, and, the, and some grass along the bottom. This is all just more sprites uh, set up in exactly the same way as from before. And this we're doing as a backdrop. Now a backdrop is going to essentially some art that is um, present on every screen in your in your game. Um, so when we later on we put in instructions or we have some other kind of information in here, that background will still be there. Saves having to recreate it on every single screen. Uh, these clouds are slightly interfering with my trees, so we can just adjust those, go back to our trial. There we go. Um, so that's given us a bit more of, of a setting. Uh, so that's looking nice. Um, and OK, I'm going to fast forward a little bit here, but all I've really done in the meantime is I've just duplicated all the stuff on the left and put it on the right, um, which, uh, which, which we mentioned earlier. And um, the, the next thing we want to do is actually wire these up into individual trials. So far, we've just been hard coding everything, which is useful at the start. But sometimes we want the app on the left, sometimes we want to the right. We sometimes want to say uh, which side the right answer is going to be and so on. And we want, we want Gridders to do all of this for us. So the first thing we're going to do is go to our screen and add a scorer. This is the, something that's going to basically decide whether or not uh, the person has given the right answer. And what we're going to do is rather than hard coding it, we're going to bind it to our spreadsheet. Now, the spreadsheet is essentially a list of all the of all the trials that you want to do in your task. And what you can then do is add in columns, in this case, answer. We'll go ahead and create one now um, that determines for that trial what the correct answer is. 
Uh, let's just go ahead and create a blank one for now. And so we can see, okay, we're going to set up a spreadsheet with two trials. So this will have, so when we run it with the spreadsheet, we'll have two trials. And the first one, the answer is left. And then the second one, the correct answer is right. Um, and we can bind more things in here to control different bits of our, of our scene. So if we go into the debug panel, we can actually set, select which row we want to look at. Um, so here, well, we've still got two apples. That's no good. So what we're going to do is instead of it always being uh, an apple, we'll bind the actual texture to the spreadsheet. Uh, we'll create a new column called apple left. And so whatever um, whatever's written in that column, that's what image, that's the image that we'll use for the apple. And if we leave it blank, then the apple won't appear. Uh, so that's good. Let's go back to our spreadsheet. So now when the answer is left, we want there to be an apple on the left. So we'll put apple.png in there. And when the apple's on the right, we want it on the right hand side and we want the other one to be blank. So now if we go back to our, our task and look at those two rows, we can see in row one, it's on the left and on row two, it's on the right. Um, so that, so that's this is how we start to build up our individual trials. So here we try that one. And we go and we get it from the tree on the left. That's great. Uh, but we see if I press the right key when that one comes up, we see on the, in my panel it's been marked as incorrect. Um, similarly, if we switch to the second row, we now get our apple on the right, and that's how we can build up um, our list of trials. And obviously, um, scientifically, that's also really useful because when you come to filling out your whole spreadsheet of trials, when you have lots of them, you can also randomize them, uh, you can put them into different blocks and so on, whatever you need to do. Um, okay, so that's looking good. But um, right now, when when the rabbit collects an apple, that's great. But when he doesn't, uh, nothing really happens. So we want to give some feedback, which is that speech bubble I showed you at the beginning. So we'll create another um, thing here called feedback. Um, well, so it's just another sprite. We'll drag that feedback image in. Um, that looks a bit like a sort of speech bubble. And then uh, what we're going to do is position it so it looks like the rabbit's thinking it. Uh, so we'll just scale that down a bit and drag it somewhere where it's like, okay, his, this looks like the rabbit's thinking like, there's not an apple there. What are you doing? Um, and then we can repeat the same trick again. We can add a, um, we don't want it there initially, and we want to show it whenever you, um, whenever you press a key that gives you an incorrect answer. So we'll give it a nice little appear animation. This is a different one that I like to use for, um, for particularly tool tips or, or feedback in this kind of way, which is called pulse, which is basically a single pulse, where it sort of scales up and scales down again. This is really nice, a nice way of just of giving something a bit of bounce and sort of drawing attention to it. Um, so we'll give it a little pulse and then we can just fade it out, um, which will give it a nice, uh, a nice sort of, a nice sort of uh, effect there. Uh, obviously, I don't want to leave it there too long. Um, and then we can we can wire up the trigger for that so that um, when we uh, give an incorrect response, uh, we will we will play that appear animation and we can then see the feedback. So similar to before, when we get a response that is um, left and it's incorrect, then we want to play appear. And um, <clears throat> now when we now when we try this out. Um, we can, um, we'll be able to see that when we get it wrong, we get the, um, we get that speech bubble. Um, the last thing we want to do is give our rabbit something to do. So we need to create an incorrect animation for the rabbit. So the first thing we do is that little delay. This is the amount, this is the time we're going to allow for the speech bubble to appear. Um, and then all we need to do is trigger our uh, leave animation again. So this is another good reason to have that leave animation as a separate thing because we can just we can just reuse it rather than having to keep making the same thing. Um, and then finally the rabbit needs to do that. So basically we don't actually need to worry about what the response was. If you get it wrong, we want to do the same thing. So we can just say, hey look, anytime you give an incorrect response, uh, just play the uh, just play the leave animation. Uh, the incorrect animation, sorry. Um, so there we go. That's all nicely wired up. Um, let's give that a go. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to select our spreadsheets. So let's go to row two. So we're going to we're going to deliberately give the wrong answer of left. So there's our apple. Uh, you press left. He goes, "Hey, there's no apple there," and then goes off screen. So we've now got um, a really nice animation sequence when you get it right, um, and we've got a nice bit of feedback when you get it wrong. Um, I think the final thing to add here is scoring, so that um, we also want to see what you heard earlier, like giving people a count of their score and how well they're doing uh, is a really nice motivating 
uh, factors. So I've set up um, some text uh, in the corner to be our score. And what we're going to do here is um, whenever we give um, the response left and it's correct, um, we're going to add one to a special field that we're going to create called score. And this is what's going to um, hold our score throughout the entire task. Um, we want to do the same thing to write. The reason we're doing it this way is that if you give a non-response, even if it, that's correct, we don't want to give you an apple because you haven't collected an apple and that would just look weird. Um, so we're doing it that way around. Um, so that's fine. So whenever we get the answer right, we will um, that number will go up by one. And then we can do the same thing here where we just bind that text component to the score. So that text there is going to show whatever the value of our score is at the moment. Um, we can add a default of zero just so at least it shows a zero at the beginning when there's nothing there. Uh, okay, so that is all now set up. Um, and what we should be able to do now is um, preview our task and actually see that all in action. So we've been doing individual screens. Here we can actually see the whole thing. So there's our rabbit. There's our, there's our apple. We go and we get it and we see our, our apple score goes up by one. This time we get it wrong. He says, hey, there's no apple there. We our screen and our score doesn't change. So that's good. That all seems to be working nicely. Um, and then the very last bit we need to do, which we haven't done yet, is we need to actually add in the no-go bit. So, so far it was been waiting for a response, but we want it to be that if you don't respond after, in this case, four seconds, um, then we just go give a non-response of none. Um, and that's all nicely wired up. Um, so here now, if we just try it out, um, we see that uh, that was incorrect and then the rabbit goes away because um, we didn't respond. But we see we got that none response. Um, so that's our basic task finished. Um, all we need to do is add some instructions and flesh out our spreadsheet with some more trials. And we can add as many different variations as we want. We can have some more where it's on the right or left. We can have one where the correct answer is, in fact, uh, no response because there's no apples anywhere. Um, and what's really powerful about this is that, um, like I said at the start, you could simplify this to a simple go, no go. You could just have one tree. You could rip out the second tree, go back to having a single tree. That would work fine. You could add some complexity by adding some different graphics. So maybe sometimes it's a bird instead of an apple. So there are some foils in there. And you could do that very easily by simply bringing in uh, a bird image and instead of and putting bird.png instead of apple.png uh, in your spreadsheet, that would work. Maybe sometimes the apples are rotten, so you could take your apple, colour it kind of green and stick a worm on it or something like that. So that's another um, way you could uh, add some add some difficulty and add some complexity to it. Um, one I just wanted to show you uh, for a bit of fun is um, you can actually add a second stimulus. So I've actually added a, a crafty fox that hides behind the tree in this one. Um, and so if I just pick a row that's got it, uh, it's exactly the same trick, same way we do the apple. But this time there's two apples, but one of the trees got a fox behind it. And so if the sneaky fox is there and you go for it, then he's going to say, oh my God, there's a fox and run away. So that's another thing you can do very easy. So there's lots of different scientific adaptations you can make to this. And, um, and it's very use and it's easy to add these different rules into the game by fitting them into the fiction, right? We don't have to, it doesn't take much for us to explain any, uh, explain that this is um, any of these additional complexities. Like rotten apples are clearly bad. Uh, foxes are scary to rabbits. There's an awful lot of, by theming it in this way, there's an awful lot of sort of uh, part of knowledge and understanding that we get for free. Um, so that's, um, that is, I think, everything uh, from me. Um, I, so I hope I've given you a nice simple framework for coming up with um, game ideas and how to how to craft a fiction that you can build and demonstrate that putting together in the game builder is as easy as putting together a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so Grilla Game Builder will be released on the 9th of June this year. Uh, we are finalizing the last few bits and finishing off all the documentation so it's all going to be ready on day one. Uh, there are still discounts available if you buy before that date. Uh, do contact our subscriptions team for more info about that. And otherwise there's a link there where you can find out more information. Um, and finally, uh, before we go into questions, uh, there are those two links again. We are also running a promo code for this event. So if you do not yet have a Gorilla account and would like to try it out, um, use Gorilla Sage 2022 when you sign up uh, and that will give you um, some, uh, some, some extra tokens for, for your first purchase. Um, that is everything from me. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to uh, seeing your questions.